Okay, welcome into our archiving and preserving the legacy of DJ Screw discussion. I have with me Lance, Scott Walker, and Julie Grob. Uh, first of all, thank you guys so much for being in the room with us today uh, for DJ Screw's birthday. Um, Lance, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? I'm no good at introductions. I know who you are to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm here because um, I'm working on a book about DJ Screw that I started, um, the idea came around probably 12 years ago. I think 12 years ago was the first time I started talking to somebody about it. Um, 15 years ago, I started working on the books, Houston Rap and Houston Rap Tapes. And a big part of what we talk about in, in those books is, uh, is DJ Screw. And so it eventually spawned its own project. And um, well, I guess I should mention I'm a writer. And that's what I do whenever I'm talking about working on those books. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of history and, and uh, you know, um, kind of field work and groundwork that led me to, to, to working on a book about DJ Screw because I, I saw how important his legacy is. So that's why I'm here. And Miss Julie Grob, uh, aka to me, she is our screw fairy godmother over at the <laughs> University of Houston. That's very nice to, of you to say. I'm a humble archivist and librarian. Um, I'm my title is um, I'm the coordinator for instruction in special collections at the University of Houston Libraries, but I'm also the founder and curator of the Houston Hip Hop Research Collection. And that collection um, focuses heavily on, on DJ Screw and the Screwed Up Click. So um, a few minutes ago, everyone got an opportunity to see the discussion that you organized, uh, Julie, over at the uh, University of Houston so with different <laughs> members of the Screwed Up Click. And Lance, you were the moderator of that discussion. So that's been a, a few years past since that. But um, as far as putting together that, that panel and moderating that discussion, what are some things that you guys um, remember as like um, having to put all of that together and maybe some advice for people who are wishing to organize and moderate uh, these types of hip hop discussions in the future. Well, Julia. I'll start if that's okay. Um, yeah. It was, uh, so I wanna say what the overall event was so people can find the panels on YouTube if they wanna look for them. Um, so we did a conference that was called Already uh, the Houston Hip Hop Conference, and it was um, the U of H Libraries, uh, U of H African American Studies, um, the Cynthia Mitchell Woods, or Cynthia Mitchell Center for the Arts, um, and then the HERE Project at Rice University. And as part of this two-day conference, um, we had a, a great event here on campus at UH that was called A Screwed Up History. And, and the Screwed Up History Day was multiple panels, um, starting from early Houston hip hop history um, with people like Willie D and Kay Reno and going through DJ Screw and the Screwed Up Click, um, some of the cultural things like slabs and syrup, and then into um, the legacy of DJ Screw. And the idea for the conference was that it would bring together um, scholars, uh, writers like Lance, and then people from the hip hop community, um, rappers, DJs, um, family members, um, to kind of situate different kinds of knowledge about hip hop side by side. And so that we could learn from, you know, someone like Lil Kiki, who was really there at the time, as well as learning um, from a scholar like Anthony Penn over at Rice. Um, and it was a really fabulous day. And the, the panels are all on YouTube. And I think 
I think the one that Lance moderated has had something like 40,000 40, views. Oh, yeah. Right now it's at double that. It yeah. over double that. It's like at 96,000 wow. <laughs> views. So, so it is, yeah, it's definitely uh, very much viewed. So Lance, as being a moderator in that discussion, um, what are some things, some takeaways that you can remember uh, about that day and moderating that discussion? Uh, personally, or as far as the the, uh, the screwed up click uh, is involved? I'll take both. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I learned not to, that was my first time doing anything like that. You know, it was my first time, you know, I've been working on this material for years and I was planning on coming to the conference because I said, you know, when they announced the conference, I said, oh, that sounds amazing. And Julie wrote me and said, hey, listen, if you're going to be here, I have a role for you. And I said, sure, that, that sounds great. And so she, she put together the panel. I, I can't take credit for that. She had put together that panel. I did slip Shorty Mac in at the last minute, you know, because I think, I don't remember, Julie, did somebody drop out or I don't remember maybe not maybe that wasn't even the case i just said can we get shorty macking because i knew he was coming and then i thought he'd it'd be really valuable to have somebody you know from early in screw's life there and um so you know so for me i was a deer in headlights the entire time because um i just never done anything like that i had interviewed um everybody except for big pokey i'd interviewed before um and i'd met him but i hadn't actually you know gotten a chance to do an interview with him so Really, I was just trying to, you know, guide the conversation. As long as people were talking, I felt like, okay, well, you know, we're, we're doing something all right here because, you know, nobody came there to hear me talk or nobody even came to hear me ask questions. They came to hear everybody um, that was on stage telling their stories. And so, um, you know, my takeaways as far as, um, this, as far as the screwed up click, um, I don't know. You know, I really, I li really loved what Misha said near the end when she was talking about how everyone was so self-made. Um, I th just thought that was so important. And at the time, you know, we heard all these great stories. We had these amazing stories from deep within how Lil Kiki um, got to know Screw and, 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 and Pokey and ESG and, 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 and Shorty Mac and, and everything like that. But, um, you know, Misha's not an artist. She's kind of on the outside of that in that sense. Um, and so for her to come in and say that, like really right near the end, as it was kind of summing it up, I just thought that was so powerful and so important. And uh, for me, that was the part that resonated as I was trying to get Lil Kiki to stop talking so we could get off the stage, you know, because <laughs> there was like probably Julie's out in the crowd waving to me like, <laughs> like let's go, let's go. <laughs> Everybody's hungry. We got to eat lunch, you know, and, and, um, so there was just, you know, but at the same time, it's like he's telling amazing stories and everybody wants to hear him. And so I want to keep letting him talk. So, you know, it was really, it, it was a learning experience. Every, every moment, every second of that experience was really a learning experience for me because it gave me, you know, um, you know, it was my first experience moderating. So it was my first experience trying to direct traffic across the stage of people who know each other way better than I know any of them and have forgotten more about this stuff than I've ever known. You know, so it was it was a it was a challenge, but I was I was so happy that she asked me to do it, and and I was yes. so happy that 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 everything went the way that it did because I just really I thought every panel that day was just so full of life and so amazing and f funny and dark and you know exciting and and sad and just everything you could imagine came out on stage that day between the I guess we had was there five I guess it was five panels right because. Yeah, uh, it was like two at each Four. table. Yeah, right. But one of them was kind of split between um, you uh, and Dr. So well, Dr. You... and Langston talking about slabs. So there were kind of five sections. But anyway, they, you know, it was just such an amazing experience. And I, I can't watch the video. I'm not one of those 96,000 people. I cannot watch myself. <laughs> on I'm so happy that many people have seen it. That's amazing. And the, the feedback that I heard from people who were in the audience. Um, was that they felt like they were watching people, you know, like hanging out in the kitchen at a party telling stories or something. Yeah. It mm -hmm. had a really positive vibe. There, people weren't there, 
you know, people didn't bring their egos. It was really about remembering Screw. And that's why we had so many amazing panelists who agreed to do it because it was such a public recognition of Screw. Yeah. Mm. That's so. beautiful. That, that was my that was my goal, by the way, is that it would that it would end up just like a bunch of people telling stories. Like that's how I grew up in Galveston. Family would sit around and, and tell stories, and so I I was hoping that it would. I don't know that it, that I, I thought that while it was happening, because like I said, it was such a deer in headlights. But um, but I was hoping that it would it would come out natural enough, because that's how my interviews have always been. They're conversational. They they go deep, but it's a conversation because that's how you really you know, that's how you really get a sense of the person that's being interviewed. And that's, that's all you want from an interview or an appearance from someone on stage like that is like, you want to really be able to see the person have a chance to express themselves and for that person to actually come out on stage, not even necessarily the performer, but the person. That actually turned out perfect for me as a viewer. And I think it's a huge reason why people have viewed it so many times because um, Lance, you didn't center yourself as part of the conversation. You more encouraged the telling of the stories more so than um, like um, popping in and like, oh, I got to get through this set amount of questions. Like sometimes uh, moderators do at these discussions and you and Julie made a perfect team um, when it came to putting the perfect people together, um, who would, you know, speak mixed into, um, getting them to tell the stories openly. So I thought that was really dope. So. And Rocky, if I can take a moment, I do also want to credit that there were a lot of people involved in putting the conference together. Um, lots of people from throughout the library. We spent about a year um, putting the whole event together. Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Well, thank you guys so much for putting that together. That is going to forever be living on YouTube is, um, you know, like I said, we're at, it's at 96,000 and who knows where it's going to be in another year or two or even this year. So um, I do... I do want to. I, I, I should say, Julie, that uh, ten-year anniversary is coming up, so you know, maybe do another one. <laughs> yeah, it might be a little hard during coronavirus. Oh, yeah, but, maybe, yeah. um, Hopefully, two years that's gone. So we'll yeah, see. our big ten anniversary, ten-year anniversary celebration has been the um, the wonderful exhibition over at the Contemporary Arts Museum. That, yeah. That. Um, Rocky has been a part of too. <laughs> yes, and or then again, it might be the perfect year. Mm -hmm. But I that actually leads me to a question about um, you guys and and how Julie, you were able to just pick up the phone and call Lance. Um, how did y'all meet? Well, um, I think. Julie, correct me if I'm wrong, but so, uh, so I grew up in Galveston and I started coming to a club called the Axiom in 1988 and Julie worked there and I did not know her. I did not meet her. She was a few years older than me and so way too cool for me to talk to. Um, but uh, you were, I think you were doing publicity and you were promoting and you were booking and you were just doing all kinds of stuff at the Axiom, which is a punk rock club, punk rock, heavy metal, experimental everything, all the kind of stuff I was into. So I knew who you were then. Um, but I don't think I actually met you until 2010. Um, I think it was 2010, whenever the Axiom reunion was, because JR introduced me to you. Oh, okay. And JR Delgado was who, uh, he was the, the owner and the founder and creator of the Axiom. So is that right? Did we meet, we met at Fitzgerald's at the, the reunion? That, that sounds right. I, I can't remember exactly when we met. I know yeah. that I um, I met um, Peter Best, the photographer mm -hmm. who you worked with on the Houston Rap book, um, and I I sent an email to him. I sort of cold contacted him because I had seen some of his work and I was so blown away by it. And I let him know what I was doing and how interested I was in his work. And that was 
probably how I learned about you and your part in that project, mm -hmm. all of the interviews. Yeah. So that, and that was probably 2000. So right, right around the same time, right? Yeah. Probably 2010, like, I think. You know what? I think the Axiom reunion was 2008. And it was. I think, yeah. And it we was met actually again. It was 2007. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so right around there. And then, and then we met you and then we met with you at U of H and it was several years before the, the collection was all together and, and before, uh, before already. So yeah, mm -hmm. right in there. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take it back a little bit further than that. Uh, <laughs> when did you guys, uh, first, um start listening to screw or or what was your feeling about hearing that kind of music julie um i actually had not really listened to screw before i started working on the collection i had read about screw i had read an article quite a while ago about sort of the culture around dj screw the the slabs and the, the lines outside his house of people wanting to get tapes and the, the lean or syrup. Um, and I just thought it was so interesting that Houston had its own really distinct subculture. Um, and, and that was interesting to me. And I had just been thinking about hip hop as something, or I started thinking about hip hop as something that special collections should be collecting because we collected other kinds of cult of cultural organizations and sort of leading um, writers and playwrights and architects and people like that. So it was really the idea that we should collect hip hop as something that's very representative of Houston, something that would diversify our collections, something that would connect with our students. Um, many of whom are from the Houston area, and um, U of H being one of the most diverse um, public universities in the country, it just made a lot of sense. Um, and I, uh, I ran into a good friend of mine who I hadn't seen in many years named Dave Dove, who runs an organization called Nameless Sound, which um, brings in um, improvisational musicians from around the world to play concerts and we got to talking and he's a big DJ screw fan and when I told him I was thinking about collecting uh, material re related to DJ screw he said oh you just have to it's the most it's the most experimental psychedelic innovative music and what a great idea and so he kind of got me connected um, with Big Bub and the guys at the shop. And so I didn't come into it as a fan, but as someone who was really looking to, you know, honor someone who had created a genre of hip hop and to fill in gaps in our, in our collecting and to connect with, with our students. Mm. What about you, Lance? Well, I should say, that um, that Julie's propensity to to document and and um, and kind of get deeper into the music, I think I can say this for her because I say it for myself, comes from our backgrounds in punk rock, because you know you grow up um, you know owning buying owning punk rock records and you you know you take the record out and you you look at the sleeve and you look on the the little print on side and okay well who you know what are the other bands that they thanked on here I want to look those bands up. You know, you start making different connections between, um, you know, because it's really, it's an underground network. And so you have to go out and find that stuff. You know, you have to, you have to dig for it. And it's really rewarding when you dig for it. And, and it's really interesting because, you know, it might be a record that, you know, not that many people know about or, or that, um, that only sold a certain number of copies, but there were people involved and those people have stories and those people connect to other people. And um, so, you know, I think that that set both of us up uniquely to to document um, another form of underground music, um, because it, would I would I be right in that, Julie? Because that's that's you know your background is is kind of the same as mine in that sense. 
Um, yeah, I definitely drew on my background um, yeah. working in underground music um, yeah. when I started working on screw culture, and it felt very familiar to begin meeting people and and kind of meet the hip hop community and and learn about the different ways people were connected and and about how the music was made and the stories behind it. Definitely. Yeah, it, and and also you know, I mean once so to set that up you know. I, I go way back with Peter Best. You know, I've I've known Peter Best since 1996. I was very good friends with him, and so um, he had moved away. He'd gone away to school, and he was he was um, uh, you know working on his uh, degree in in photography and fine arts. And in 2004, I was still in Houston. I was writing for the Houston Chronicle. I was writing for the Houston Press, and I mean, basically most papers in town. I was writing for at that point. And uh, he was living in New York, and he started coming back to Houston. He said, I'm, hey, I'm going to start coming back to Houston. I'm going to take pictures of the, all the gangster rappers we grew up listening to. And, you know, I knew some of, I knew some Houston music because I'm from Galveston. And so, you know, when I was in high school, the, the original Ghetto Boys came out. And when I was a senior in high school, um, that's when, you know, Mind Playing Tricks came out. And so that's when all that broke. So in high school, I was listening to, you know, Raheem, Royal Flush, Ghetto Boys, Def Four, you know, that kind of stuff made it down um you know made it down to galveston because everybody from houston goes to galveston for, to go to the beach and they brought their tapes with them and so we heard you know we heard that music so 2004 peter best starts working on this project and he's a few months in and he says he comes to me he says hey look you know i go out and i take pictures of all these guys and they tell me these amazing stories and um you know you're a writer you should come on board with me and and you know i'm working on a book you should come on and you should write this book for me like we're doing it on spec i don't have a publisher I don't know who's going to publish it. I don't know when it's going to come out, but you should work with me on it. Crazy <laughs> idea. I was like, hell yes. Because um, I love, I love Houston. You know, I grew up in Galveston, but I fell in love with Houston early and I moved to Houston when I was 19 years old and I was totally in love with the city. Still am obviously. And um, so for me, it wasn't so much about uh, documenting hip hop, although that was a big part of it because I love hip hop ever since, you know, I was in middle school. But uh, for me, it was more that, um, you know, I want to do something for Houston. And because I was realizing quickly that so much of that music that he was talking about was underground. And so whenever I started really getting into, you know, documenting and talking to people and just kind of, you know, my, just even my first handful of interviews, like my, maybe my first dozen interviews, I was like, wow, these guys are punk rock. Because, you know, these guys, they, they're independent. They, they save up their own money sometimes it's street money sometimes it's dirty money sometimes it's from crazy sources but they take their money and they invest it in their own studio time and then they start their own record labels and then they release their own product and then they drive around town they pop their trunk and they sell it i was like that's so so totally punk rock like even punk rockers are not that punk <laughs> punk rock are not that punk rock punk rockers will never show up in your neighborhood and open the trunk and go hey you want to buy my stuff which is like just so punk rock to me so you know I fell in love with it really just instantly, you know, when I started working with Peter, I just instantly fell in love with it. And it was a lot of, you know, I knew DJ Screw. I saw DJ Screw in person one time, you know, before he passed, you know, I knew some of his music, but I didn't know how far it reached. And I had no idea how many people were involved. So that was really, you know, I grew up knowing some Houston hip hop music um, and some Houston rap music throughout the nineties, but you know, there was a whole new awakening for me you know, once I started that, that project, or probably early 2005 is whenever I joined Peter on that. Wow. Yeah. Well, um, so what are some of the um, issues that you've had, uh, Julie, or you've had Lance with um, collecting these stories and archival materials julie uh you could answer on that question um sure gosh there's i mean there's a lot of issues um i think um you know it's taken more legwork than i would have expected um it's really taken you know um, 
reaching out again and again to people over the years. Um, because a lot of people, you know, they're in the middle of their careers. They're not really thinking as much about their legacy and, you know, they've got a lot of priorities. So archiving, and I'm talking about artists now, and so archiving their material may not be at the forefront of their mind, but it's really important that we do this now because, um, you know, some, some forms of music have very little documentation, like something like the blues. Um, recordings weren't saved. Um, you know, there's, there's not that many photographs of certain artists. Um, so it's really important to be documenting hip hop while people are around and while people may still have their material. Um, also, a lot of the material is, um, is audiovisual or, or digital material that has um, serious preservation issues. And so it's important to get that material um, because when we acquire things for the library, you know, we, we preserve things um, using the, you know, the latest technology and the best archival practices. Um, so, you know, it's really important to do that now. Um, so it's taken a lot of, um, you know, laying a lot of groundwork and um, working to build trust. You know, I do rep represent, um, you know, a big institution and that can be a positive thing because everybody knows the University of Houston, you know, we're Houston's university. You know, we're right there in Third Ward. We have a really diverse um, student population. Um, but, you know, also people may, may not want to give or sell their material to a big institution. So, you know, there's a lot of work getting to know people. Um, I'm coming to people as, you know, a white archivist, you know, a cultural outsider in a lot of ways. Um, so that's something I'm very conscious of. And I've really been working in recent years to, to you know, put myself in the background more um, and really um, let the community kind of try to drive the collecting and, and get more community input on what kinds of events we do, things like that. Um, so I think those are all, are all issues we've had. Um, I do think, the sort of happiest accident maybe is that by starting with DJ Screw, I think we just got a lot of support from that, especially at the time that, that the collection started in 2010, there wasn't as much attention on Screw. Um, and there had been negative attention around Screw that, you know, because of his association with, with lean or syrup um, and his early death. And so I think for a lot of people, having the University of Houston come to them and say, you know, we want to preserve Screw's story and honor him, you know, and make it available for students and researchers and future generations. I think was really appealing. Um, people were really happy about that. And part of the happy accident was just that Screw was so beloved that people wanted to go out of their way to support that mission. Um, so um, that really helped to get things, you know, kind of snowballing. But, um, but you know, we're still, um, we're still collecting. We're still looking for material and, um, we're interested in anything related to Screw and the Screwed Up Click, especially um, kind of historical material, things from, you know, Screw's lifetime, things that really document the creative process around Screw music and culture. Um, but we also collect, you know, we have collections related to um, DJs from an earlier period, um, I'm interested in getting more material related to women in hip hop. Um, very interested in documenting um, Mexican Americans, Latinx people in hip hop, um, which is such an important component of the Houston story. Um, so, very eager to keep working with people and um, 
building building the collection. Yeah, I, I would say you know same same deal as far as um, the um, the obstacles that that you, uh, you 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 come upon. I think with screw it's kind of easier and more difficult in some ways. It, you know, there's so many people involved that it's almost kind of like it's a little bit easier to start because you can there's more people that you can get involved. Um, there's more people to get involved in the sense that like not everybody's going to want to talk to you right away. Um, and they shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't be, shouldn't be easy to get an interview. I don't think, I think it should be hard. I think it should, I think you should really have to work for it. And um, not everybody just wants to share their story right out of the gate. And um, you know, not everybody, everybody has uh, different feelings about it. Some people are anxious to tell their stories about screw. Some people say, Oh my God, I've been waiting forever. Nobody's ever talked to me about DJ Screw, and and I really, you know, I'm I'm so happy to do this. And other people are a little bit more suspicious. And like I said, they should be, you know, like same thing with Julie. You know, I'm a white dude. I'm an outsider. Uh, I'm 100% aware and conscious of that. And the more and more you make yourself less the story, and more and more you make it about highlighting the voices and and helping to put their stories out there, and not necessarily tell their stories but give them a platform for them to tell their stories you know that's um you know that that's the end goal and um so you know with some people you really have to work you have to really really work for that you have to continue like julie said you have to continue to reach out to them you have to continue to make calls you have to continue to work around that and hope that the rest of the work that you're doing uh, or the visibility of the rest of the work that you're doing eventually helps to engender at least enough trust to where when you persistently reach out that eventually somebody who's maybe been holding back and doesn't want to talk to you or, or in the case of Julie doesn't want to um, maybe is not so anxious to um, provide archival materials um, then maybe comes around and is maybe a little bit more open to the idea and I'm always surprised you know because it's hard not to take it personal uh, when you're you're reaching out to someone and you just keep you know, they just keep blowing you off or like, you know, some people will say, oh, yeah, call me Wednesday night, eight o'clock. And then you call and they, you know, nowhere to be found. And, you know, so it's hard not to take it personally. But then eventually, you know, it's really rewarding when you're very persistent about it. He's like, I know I want to talk to this person. And, um, so, you know, until they tell me, hey, listen, I don't want to talk to you, which has happened a couple of times. A couple of people said, look, all due respect, I don't want to talk at all. And then other people, you know, I've talked to other people like, one person I've tried to interview a couple times and it has devolved into crying within the first couple minutes and we just, we couldn't get anywhere. And it's like, you know what, it's okay. You know, sometimes, you know, it's, it's different with everybody and you have to keep that in mind. You have to understand that like you're going to face different obstacles when it comes to um, wanting to involve, you know, people because their, their life stories, you don't know what's going on in their lives at that moment. And you don't know what's going on in their lives as far as, how it relates to Screw and um, how they feel about telling his story or how they feel about whatever sensitive, you know, parts of the story are, are there. And, you know, be that the case, then you, they, you know, there really has to be a, an establishment of trust uh, between you. So it takes a long time. It takes a lot of patience. You know, the idea for the Screw book came up in 2008 was when I really started talking about it. And, you know, it started coming together in the years since then, but it's really taken that long to to come around and try to get you know just i still don't have everybody that i want you know i got a little bit more time to finish it but I still don't have everybody i want but you know you 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 keep pushing until there's no more time if you wouldn't mind me asking about um the start of your collection, Julie, um, in as far as Screw is concerned, uh, you told me about how the idea started coming about, but do you remember um, the first um, collection, like the first items and, and how you, how did you get those? Well, we started by going to the screw shop and buying, you know, a hundred CDs of the the diary of the originator chapters from the screw tapes, um, because 
even then we were a little more donation based at the beginning. Um, but even then I knew that, you know, we had to sort of put our money where our mouth was, you know, we couldn't go up to people and say, you know, we're starting this Houston hip hop collection and, you know, we want you to donate this to us and have the person say, well, what's in the collection? And we say, well, nothing yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that wasn't going to impress anybody. Yeah. Um, so we started by acquiring all this material from, from Bub at the screw shop. Um, and then we had a, a reception at the library and we had, we had all the CDs out for people to see and we invited um, people from the screwed up click and it was a small group who came, but it was some really important people who came. Um, little Randy came and he donated the first screw tape to the collection with 99 Live. Uh, Misha Hawkins came and um, uh, DJ Screw's father, Papa Screw, came. And from that, and there were some other people there as well. Um, and from that reception, um, that was when I learned about DJ Screw's record collection, which I think is, is truly the heart of the Houston hip hop collection. And probably the most important thing that we acquired. Um, so uh, DJ Screw's father had Screw's record collection just in his garage. And it had been there since Screw passed. So it had been there for a decade. And, you know, it, it was, it wasn't being taken care of the way you know, you would want something so historically and culturally important to be taken care of. Um, you know, it was in a garage like any garage. There were water leaks. It was dusty. You know, there was stuff lying around. And, um, you know, but he had kept it intact. And I don't know if he knew what he wanted to do with it, but I thought it was so important for researchers to be able to, you know, see even a part of the collection and get an idea of, of, you know, what Screw's record collection was like and to preserve some of these rare records because they're, they're, you know, maybe half and half, you know, a lot of them are DJ 12 inches. Um, so they're not, they're not in libraries. They're rare. Um, a lot of them are, are, you know, from Houston. Um, there's a lot of test pressings which are the, um, which is like the vinyl record that's pressed as a test and often like DJs and people will give it a listen before the complete run of the record is pressed. And um, so we really did kind of a salvage mission, you know, when he agreed that we could um, make those records part of the DJ Screw collection at, at UH. Um, we took a team of people over there, um, people from the library, people from African American studies, uh, Dave Dove, some other friends. And we went over there and we had like a two day working group. I mean, we brought back 1500 records to the library. Hmm. And then we had like a year long process where our students cleaned each record individually and put put the records in archival sleeves. Um, and then we hired a cataloger to catalog all of the records um, so that we could identify what we had. Um, and then we ended up getting some more records for the collection from Bub later. So we've got over 1600 of his original collection. And to my knowledge, it's the first collection of a DJ's records in a library in the world as far as I know. Cornell now has Africa Bombada's records, but they didn't have that yet at the time. Um, so I'm really proud of that. That's probably the thing I'm most proud of with the collection. B because, you know, they could have so easily been split up, you know, sold to collectors around the world, or, you know, and, and I'm sure some of the records went out the door. Um, Papa Screw was very generous with things. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of just, you know, irreplaceable things in that collection. 
and the fact, you know, the, the library, um, we could just, we can do things for the material and with the material that individuals can't do. I think that's why it's important to build a collection like this. Um, you know, that we were able to clean everything, catalog everything. We store it in secure climate controlled storage. Um, it's all together in one place. So, you know, someone like Lance or a, or a scholar can come in or even another DJ who's just interested, um, we're open to the public, um, can come in and look through the boxes of the records and um, they can come in and look through um, photographs and screw tapes that we have in the collection. And so we're able to to preserve that material, to keep it together, and to get it out there for researchers in a way that, that wouldn't be possible um, without the archival collection. And what about you, Lance, um, on uh, gathering stories and um, how, what was your, the beginning of your journey with, with Screw? Well, it, it, it would coincide with, you know, the Houston Rap Book in 2005, whenever I started working on that with Peter, because, you know, the, the Screw research was part and parcel of what we were doing. It wasn't, you know, I mean, we were, we were casting a wide net. I wouldn't say that we were really focused on the kind of more, um, uh, underground hip hop, you know, what some people might call conscious rap or backpacker hip hop. There's a whole nother scene of that. You know, Chaotix is a, is a group that stands out. K and the Foundation, those kinds of groups. We weren't really focused as much on that part of it. We were kind of more focused on the kind of more gangster rap, street kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, Screw was a big part of that. So, you know, I was doing interviews with anybody I could uh, for that project. Anybody I could meet, anybody I could get in touch with. Um, and learning about how they factored into the greater story of, of, of Houston hip hop music. And then, like I said, probably, you know, a few years into that project. I mean, those books came out in late 2013 and early 2014. So we worked on them for the better part of a decade, you know, before they ever came out. And so uh, during that time, uh, I was doing interviews with people from all over, you know, South Park Coalition, rap a lot. I mean, you name it, you know, all different parts of, um, of you know, the Houston uh, rap music lexicon. But um, I'd say I started focusing really deeper on Screw um, really after those books came out um, because, you know, while I was collecting interviews um, about everything, you know, I, I was focusing on kind of a bigger picture for those books. So, um, so again, it was the same sort of thing though. I, I just went in to interview anybody I could. I looked at Screw tapes and I'd find names of people on Screw tapes. Oh, who's this person? Okay, well, let me see if I can find them. You know, who are they on the tape with? You know, maybe this person knows them. You know, hey, uh, Kiki, you were on this tape with this guy. You know how to reach him? Oh yeah, here's his number. Okay, you know. And so then you just kind of start figuring out how uh, the, the role that everybody plays in this, this bigger picture as it, uh, as it relates to, to DJ Screw. And you start, you know, you start with the interviews. Obviously you build a library. I mean, I've got a, a massive library of interviews just about DJ Screw because everybody, who's alive, who I've, I've been able to reach, which of course, plenty of people now who've passed that um, I got to meet, but I never got to interview, you know, I met Pimp C, I never got to like sit down and interview him. You know, I met Big Mo, I never got to sit down and interview him, you know. So, you know, Hawk, same deal. I got to meet him and talk to him, you know, a couple of times, but we never actually got to sit down for the interview. So you have to, you have to cast a net out in that direction too and try to kind of source stuff. But you just start looking at how, you know, the different stories um, in the interviews kind of line up with one another and start to paint a picture. I mean, you, in the process of this, you're going to run into, you know, okay, the night before he died, there must've been six dozen people with him because, you know, so many people say, oh, I was with him the night before he died, you know, or, you know, so many people gave him his first turntables or so many people were the first ones to tell him to slow a record down. So you, there's parts of it you, you kind of can't take quite as seriously as others, but there's other parts of the stories that you start to see, okay, this lines up really with what this other person was saying. It might seem unrelated, but you know, 
this helps me to kind of research and just try to kind of figure out what, what I know for the most part is true. You know, what, what can I, you know, because you're not going to get the whole story. I'm not going to get every day of 29 years of DJ Screw's life. Um, especially not having gotten a chance to meet him or sit down and interview him myself. So, you know, it's about building, it's been about just building up the library, that archive of, of stories and, you know, sometimes interviewing people two, three, four, five times, you know, depending on what they're game for. And uh, just kind of seeing how all of that builds a, a timeline uh, of his life. I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> No, that is all really good information. And um, w originally the question was with regards to how you got started with the screw collection and you, you definitely went in to that. Um, so with all of that said and how, you know, you guys have been spending um, this time gathering materials and stories, uh, Julie, what is your one of your favorite items or even just most popular request to, oh, my God, I got to look at this item in the collection? What are what's one or a couple of of those items that you've collected? I, I think um, my favorite set of items is probably Hawks rhyme books. We have about 20 of the notebooks that he used to write out his rhymes, and then about a thousand loose pages also of his notebooks. Hawk was different, um, you know, real screw heads know. Hawk was different from um, most of the other people in the screwed up clique who primarily freestyled, in that Hawk was really a writer. And the notebooks are just amazing. Um, a lot of them post-date his work on the screw tapes, I believe, but um, you know, you can really see his his thought process, his creative process, his choices as a rapper um, that he's captured on the page. They also include things like, you know, dominoes games, phone numbers. There's a, a list of gifts for his niece and nephew. Um, so you really see him as a person and you know, how he had the notebooks with him and, and used them to capture different things about his life. Um, but I think that's also a really unusual, um, unusual set of material for an academic library to hold um, and really helps um, tell the story of hip hop, tell the story of how rappers work, um, tells the story of the kind of underground gangster rap um, uh, that Lance was talking about, and, and also some of the, you know, just the independent kind of uh, hip hop that Hawk re released on his albums. Um, although it's becoming more common now, um, when we started the collection, collecting hip hop in an academic library was uh, really outside the box. Um, so I feel very lucky to have this representation of, um, of Hawk as an artist and a person in our collection. And what about you, Lance? What is one of the most interesting stories that maybe someone has read out of your book and <laughs> asked you more about or one of your personal favorite stories of through. Hmm. My favorite, like my favorite, favorite ones. You're gonna have to read the book. <laughs> I knew he was gonna say that. <laughs> you knew I was gonna say that. Uh, yeah. Okay, oh. or just maybe um, in times past, uh, through the years of collecting stories surrounding Screw in the SUC. I'm not sure I know how to answer that one. Um, my, you know what, my favorite times, honestly, um, have been uh, spending time with his family, any of his family. That's been my, those have been my favorite moments because you just see a reflection of him 
in their eyes and and you feel it from their hearts you know you spend time around big bub like he's just got such a gigantic heart and you know i he was one of the first people i met i met big bub in 2004 2005 at the old screw shop you know like I've, i just feel like i've made a journey with him and you know i can't claim i know him that well and i'm sure he doesn't feel like he knows me that well because we only see each other once or twice a year um but um you know those are those are the most rewarding moments is to you know anytime that you get to a point where you've built trust where you get invited in you know it's it's really an honor and it's really really special and um nothing compares to that you know spending time in smithville with his sister you know um saw his dad last year you know a couple of months before he passed you know we went and saw him for father's day with with screws um sister red and, and his brother charles and you know those those have been my really my favorite moments also because it you know it's just given me a chance to I'm a, I'm a disembodied voice over the phone for so many people, you know, and, and I, I can tell them something about myself and something about my goals for the project through my questions, you know, your questions reveal everything about your intentions and they reveal everything about who you are. And so, um, you know, there's plenty that people can learn um, from me, uh, or, you know, about what I'm doing. Um, through our interviews, but nothing compares to, to, you know, being, being invited in and getting to, to spend time like that. And, you know, for that matter, also, you know, the already conference that we talked about earlier was, was so important because it was like, we were honoring screw up on stage for the first time. His dad was there, you know, big Bob was there. His cousin, Shorty Mac was there, his little brother, Al D. I mean, you know, there's so many people in the audience that, you know, got to see like, Oh, wow. You know, look at this. This is really, really special thing that they're honoring him. Those are the most special, you know, moments for me. The stories, of course, are all amazing. And, you know, I, I can't wait to, to deliver the book into the world and so people can read this compendium of stories because most of the book is oral history. You know, I can't wait for people to get to read other people's stories about Screw, that people who knew Screw very well will, are going to read a story somebody else tells about Screw and go, oh, wow, man, you know. Like I never knew that about Screw. People who knew him really well, you know, because he he didn't sleep. So you know, you got to think about the fact that like Screw kind of lived two lifetimes in one because you know he was awake more than anybody, and you know he was working around the clock. So it was like his his you know so he connected with so many people and people really genuinely like richly deeply connected with him and to the point where they felt like they were his best friend because that's how he made them feel, you know. And so many people tell that story and they really genuinely felt that way because he made them feel that way. And um, so, you know, the, those personal connections for me, um, that's, that's the most rewarding part of it. And that's, that's my favorite part. And, and that will, will be, I think, my favorite part in the end is that, you know, people get to, to hear other people's recollections of Screw and, and read those and, and connect with them, feel that connection. And I'd like to add on too to what Lance was saying. Um, I definitely agree with everything you've said. Um, it's been um, just a wonderful experience to meet so many um, people, so many artists and family members um, and develop relationships with them. Um, but it's also really exciting um, to do things like teach classes to U of H students, um, to teach the hip hop history and culture class session when they come to visit the archive and see the materials um, to teach the or to to do a tour for the um, the achievement initiative for minority males um, which is a student group that came to the archive to look at hip-hop materials um, and our reading room is open to the public so you know we have we have scholars and graduate students and and you know um, other librarians who come in, but you know, we also just have fans, um, students or people in the general public who want to come see the material. And um, you know, we're just as excited to have people who say, you know, oh, we're in from out of town, we live in Mississippi, and we just wanted to come check it out, you know, as we are to have a researcher, you know, who's writing an article. Um, so I love sort of 
completing that circle of the material that's come from the hip hop community, you know, to the library where we can sort of take care of it and make it available. And then to, to, you know, our guests who get a chance to, you know, spend one-on-one -on -one time with this material, things that Screw touched, um, you know, things that are, that are rare and, and that you'll only see in the archive. Well, I actually have a question that uh, kind of spawns off of that, uh, that comment, Julie. Um, of course, you both, you know, made mention to the fact that you are white storytellers um, and white collectors in um, hip hop spaces and in some places that's privilege. And in other places, it kind of, um, you know, within the minority community is like, who is this white person coming in and collecting and preserving these stories? So yeah. um, I was going to ask uh, the both of you, um, maybe starting with Lance, um, what is some of the pushback that you've received um, even uh, from the white owned institutions on collecting these stories, you know, not making mention to people, but I know that it's been difficult uh, for you, Lance, in publishing stories related to, like you guys said, someone who passed away from um, supposedly a drug overdose and, um, you know, definitely has a connection with uh, lean and syrup that's may mention hand in hand with him. Uh, how have you overcome those obstacles within those publishers and the institutions that you've had to deal with? Well, my publisher is great. Uh, my publisher is um, the University of Texas in Austin, University of Texas Press. And they, um, they're very open to, to basically everything. I mean, you know, I, there's plenty of language that that's uh, that comes out in my interviews that they um, probably wouldn't you know put out there themselves, but they don't censor it, uh, and neither do I you know because um, I think it's so important to authentically reflect um, the stories that you're told, and it goes kind of back to what Julie was saying earlier, to take yourself out of it as much as you can you know um, to make sure that you know like you said be conscious of the fact that you're a white storyteller telling um, stories about black music. It's black music, you know, 100%. Um, but, you know, also, and you I mean, look at the cases of each of us, we've carved out a lane that nobody else was doing. You know, it's just like, you know, okay, well, I'm gonna do this because nobody else is doing it. You know, if somebody else, um, especially if there was a black writer writing a DJ screw book, I never would have done it. I never would have taken it on. You know, and I'm sure Julie would say exactly the same thing as far as the collection goes. These were things that that um, that weren't being done. That's okay. Well, I can I can pick this up because there's nobody else out there doing it. And um, even all these years later, it's not like the you know the idea has come up um, from anyone else. So uh, with with the institution, with the University of Texas, they've been fantastic because they you know they put it to me like, look, do your work. You know, do your fact checking. Do you know? Go deep into your work. Make sure that what you're doing is right because we can't possibly know. You know, we're an institution up here in Austin, and um, you know we depend on you to be the one who digs deep and uh, make sure that you're that you're really doing the work. Um, so I haven't really had pushback from them, but I would say that it has. Uh, there's definitely been the obstacles that I was talking about earlier. You know, who are you? You know, who are you? What are you doing? Who are you affiliated with? Who have you talked to? Um, and you know what? You have to have an answer to those questions and you have to have thought about those questions and um, you have to to realize that you absolutely have privilege and so what are we doing with that privilege okay well we're both going to take it straight to the institutions and we're going to take what has been underground music and we're going to push it through the institutional system we're going to push it through the, the, the you know the university system and to know how important that is um, we know that it's legitimate music we know that it's uh, got a legitimate deep, long, rich history. So let's, you know, 
use our privilege to take it a further step and you know bring it into the university system bring it into the academic publishing to where now you know those books and those collections will be accessible and uh, and and searchable through you know internet databases and libraries and you know bookstores and and universities everywhere so you know it's a matter of you know not denying that you have the privilege but just saying okay well i've definitely got white privilege it absolutely exists and if you deny it and you don't think it exists that's because you live a life that um has you know has been kind enough to where you, to where you don't have to realize that it exists and you know you can't possibly um do interviews with people and talk about their lives like this and not realize the privilege that surrounds you it's it's impossible you know you just can't get this deep into the work and go oh you know the playing field is absolutely level for me growing up in the country end of galveston as it was for somebody growing up in south park or fifth ward or sunnyside or wherever you're talking about like you start to realize the ways that, that you know the communities in, in in big cities are marginalized you know in environmental racism you know in you know industrial racism you know the big chemical plants and you know the toxic waste dumps and everything like that that you find around fifth ward sunnyside you know all these things come to light um and so you you have to you have to use that privilege for good um to go back to the to the part about pushback you know i've definitely faced that you know who are you what are you doing and uh you just have to get really good it was the same way that peter best and i did houston rap because here comes two white dudes rolling into south park or Yellowstone or, or Sunnyside or South Acres or whatever. Here's two white dudes get out of a car. One of them's got a camera, one of them's got a tape recorder and a notebook. You know, what's this? And so you have to get really good at, you know, honestly and very plain language, explaining yourself and explaining what you're doing and being able to go deeper and to and and not only to just explain yourself, but to listen and to to understand, you know, to listen to what people are asking you and think about why they ask you certain things and um, to really consider that the experience that that is that will be portrayed in what you do uh, is not your experience it's it's not it's not what you lived it's not what you grew up understanding it's not the world that you know and so you know you have to go deep in that deep enough in that to you can never you can never actually make yourself neutral you can never actually write yourself completely out of it you know, but you have to go deep enough and to ask enough questions and to really consider all those perspectives to, to, to try to get to a point where you're reflecting it as accurately as you can. And for me, that has always amounted to making my work really heavy on oral history so that um, the, most of the words you read are not me. You know, they're, I transcribe all of my own interviews because I want to get the exact uh, things that people are saying. I want to get the exact feel for the conversation because I want to, when you read it, I want you to read it like it's that person telling you a story and not me translating it. And so I don't clean the language up. I don't change the language any. I don't do any kind of um, editing to the vernacular or the slang or the accent or the way that, that some words are put together because I think it's a really important reflection of, uh, of, of what's, you know, of the history of, of, of this music. Um, yeah. So, um, with the, the library, um, I've never had any pushback. Um, I think the library has always supported the idea of having a hip hop collection, um, of having this collection that, that told diverse stories that was of interest to our students. Um, the only thing I really wasn't allowed to do was um, with the Already Conference, we thought about having a concert with it. And it was pretty shortly after the Trey Day where the people got shot on TSU campus. Mm -hmm. And so the administration was uh, very wary of doing some kind of concert event because um, they didn't want something like that to happen at U of H. Um, other than that, I've had a lot of support um, you know, it's really required support at all levels of the library to make the hip hop collection happen. And it's actually, in fact, um, a collection that is, that is heavily promoted by the library and heavily supported by the library. Um, there definitely is a, a problem with um, the world of hip hop archives. 
um, and the world of librarianship in general. I think most hip hop archivists are white and that reflects the library community. Um, in, um, I think librarians are about 87% white, which doesn't track at all with the, the you know, racial and ethnic breakdown of our country. Um, so it's something I'm really concerned with. And I think when I started the collection, um, I had done a lot of diversity work in libraries, trying to um, bring in more people of color into um, rare book librarianship and archives. So I felt like, you know, well, I've done the work, you know, it's, it's okay for me to come in and, um, you know, work with black materials and black culture. Um, I think differently about it now. Um, you know, I do think that it's, it's problematic. Um, so like Lance was saying, I'm trying more and more to step back from being such an active voice in the collection. And an example of that is the, um, the exhibit we did, um, uh, gosh, just recently, um, the um, Brothers in Rhyme, Fat Pat, Big Hawk, and the Screwed Up Click. Um, for that exhibit, I invited about a dozen people, um, uh, you know, people who had been involved with the collection somehow, whether they were um, young scholars or writers. Um, Lance was one of the people, <coughs> um, visual or music artists. Um, we had a party planner. And it was a mix of men and women, um, different races and ethnicities. And I had those people contribute labels about members of the screwed up clique so that we were getting um, multiple voices so that it wasn't me interpreting the material for the audience. I did some of the um, um, you know some of the more narrative parts. Uh, here's who Fat Pat was, here's who Hawk was, here's who Screw was. Um, but um, you know it was really a community effort and I'd like to see us working in that way more. Having events where people from the community plan the event, hold the event, you know, having an exhibit where we work with someone from the community to curate, um, you know, maybe bringing in some kind of um, community archivists to do work on the collection. Um, I just think that libraries have to do a lot more to respond to, you know, the problematic nature of, of our makeup. Um, and I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but it's a question that I wrestle with a lot. And I think for me personally, um, you know, I just hope that I, that in, you know, founding and growing this collection that I've done more good than harm in that. And that's, you know, that's the scale I try to keep balanced to the best of my ability. Um, but I think we're going to see changes in the years ahead. I don't know exactly what it will look like. Um, but I think there's been a lot of um, attention in the archival field to things like community archives that um, are developed outside of institutions, um, to collaboration, to trying to break down, you know, white supremacy culture in archives. Um, and I think that's really important and, you know, we'll, I'll certainly going to try to do what I can to make things better. Thank you for that, Julie. Thank you so much for that. Um, and Lance, um, as we're closing out this discussion, um, I know that you are about to uh, release um, not too long from now, uh, the DJ Screw biography, but as far as collecting stories, are you continuing that journey even after this? And if so, how can people contact you um, in ways of maybe possibly telling you a story that you didn't know about DJ Screw or uh, the SUC? 
if so oh, if you're still yeah. collecting stories i am definitely i mean the um the window is still open just barely so uh, i would say if there are people who um who knew screw well and who really have you know real personal stories about them they should definitely get in touch because uh i have turned in a complete version of the book but it's not a finished version um so i can still add to it i can still add some voices to it and i very much want to do that because the book is really a like i said it's a compendium of you know uh, of of stories told by other people um so people can reach me through uh, my website lancecottwalker.com or houstonraptapes.com and you know instagram twitter i'm out there like facebook i'm 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 definitely accessible anybody who tries to reach me um should know i write everybody back um and um and i would love to hear from people there's there's still a window open the book won't come out probably till next fall um you know it takes a long time once you once you turn it in there's all kinds of processes you have to go through especially with an academic press it's right now being peer reviewed and then you know then we'll get into a series of edits and um so i've got a window open between now and then really over the next month um, where I'm still reaching out to some people that um, that I maybe got to talk to at some point, but I kind of still want to talk to again and and get um, get some more perspectives from them. And it just kind of also I've just been kind of checking back in with some people who've you know really been helpful you know over the years. I mean, there's there's been so many, um, but you know there's a there's a few people I kind of just want to check back in with just as a personal and professional courtesy. You know, hey, I'm finishing up the book. Um, you know, anything else you've been thinking about? Anything else you think that like, oh, you know, I always ask people, what do people get wrong about Screw? You know, what do, what do people always leave out when they talk about Screw? You know, those are the kinds of things that I ask because there's plenty of stuff out there about Screw, but, um, you know, it, you know, how, how accurate is it? Or, you know, is there something that they just keep getting wrong? You know, so, um, so I will continue that process. I think I would imagine, you know, that that process will continue to snowball, you know, in the future. Um, I don't know if there's ever a point when I'll be completely, you know, disassociated from it and not doing it. I, I, I certainly have a big enough archive um, of stuff. You know, I, I, I might do an interview with somebody for an hour and a half and then, you know, a little sliver of text from them appears in the book. But then I understand how they factor into the greater story and I'm able to, you know, have more knowledge about how to to uh, connect them to the other parts of the story, you know? So, you know, everything helps and everybody I talk to who genuinely knew Screw, you know, sometimes you talk to somebody, oh, I knew Screw, and then you talk to them and you're like, <laughs> you met him, you know, <laughs> you met him once, but you know, then, then other people, you, you might not hear their name associated with Screw that much. And then you talk to them and you're like, oh, wow, this person was in, you know, pretty tight with Screw because they've got some amazing stories that like, you could really tell that they were there and they really knew him. And so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's kind of endless. I mean, there's, there's always going to be people that pop up and I hope that in the end that I've included most all of them, if not all of them that I can and sourced stuff from the people that I didn't get to talk to from, you know, older interviews, you know, the screw did three or four, maybe five interviews during his lifetime. And um, so I was able to source from those to quote him in the book. And I quoted him from stuff where he talks on screw tapes. And, um, you know, same thing with Fat Pat. Fat Pat never did an interview, you know. So all I have really are, are his musings on screw tapes or, or live tapes where he's talking between songs and that kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it's never ending. You know, I'll, I know that once I've turned in the very final version of the book, and it's going off to the printer that somebody that I've been dying to talk to for years will finally call me back. That's just, just the way it happens. So, you know, I don't know what the ending of it is, but um, you know, it's a, it's a deep well and it's an amazing history and um, it never ceases to amaze me um, how, how rich of a, a history it is and how profound of an effect screw had on the people's um, on the lives of the people who, who knew him because it just, you know, people who really knew him, they, they still feel him, around them they you know you get a sense that they they still feel him in the air you know you drive through houston doesn't feel like dj screw's been gone for 20 years you know you hear his music everywhere you see his face painted on walls you know you see people wearing his shirts you go to the record store that's been open for 20 years since he died still only selling his records and they're open you know 
that's amazing. That's a, so I think that Screw's legacy is just going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And, um, and people are going to continue to come out of the woodwork and stories are going to continue to come up. And, and um, you know, my book might just be the first of many. Who knows? And what about you, Julie? Um, so uh, uh, I know that you definitely have the SUC collection um, and DJ Screw collection, uh, but I know you collect more than that over at the University of Houston. And there's uh, so many people within Houston who have stories related to hip hop. So how would they be able to contact you? What type of materials do you take? Um, and how do they get those to you in this time of uh, COVID-19 that we're dealing with right now at the time of this? Um, yeah, I'd love to hear from people. Um, so, you know, we have collections. Um, we have the... Um, Carlos Garza, DJ Styles papers. We have DJ Steve Fournier papers, um, some earlier icons in Houston hip hop. Um, we have some collections of younger artists, um, Fat Tony, Dat Boy T. Um, we have uh, collections related to businesses like Pen and Pixel, um, the graphic artist um, company, and the Samplified Digital Recording Studios. Um, so yeah, I'm really interested in things related to the screwed up click, um, things related to the early years of Houston hip hop. Um, you know, we're interested in any kind of hip hop, um, in materials related to women, to Hispanic or Latinx artists, um, and to, you know, things like jewelry and, and cars, you know, all of that. Um, so our collections include a lot of audio material, um, audio, you know, screw tapes, um, master recordings of different artists, um, you know, vinyl, CDs, cassettes. Um, we have uh, videos and DVDs, um, a lot of photographs, artwork, um, you know, different kinds of memorabilia. And then uh, like business records are really interesting. We have the invoices from Samplified Digital Recording Studios. Um, so really just, you know, if you have a question or a suggestion, you have something in, in your basement that might, or well, we don't have basements here, your attic that might <laughs> be good, your garage that might be good um, for the collection, um, just contact me, my email is jgrob at uh.edu. Um, my Twitter is at Julie Grobe. So it's just J-U-L-I-E-G-R-O-B. Um, those are probably the best places to reach me. Um, I guess contact me one of those places. I'll give you my cell number and we can, can text or call and chat. And I think we can bring in material um, even during this weird time. Um, we do have some people on who are going into the library every day and we can work with one of them to um so that you can drop off material and um you know we'll figure something out i don't want the collection to just grind to a halt um because of the pandemic um i'd really like to see it grow and deepen um i think it's a really important resource and and i'd love to add your material to it and we do, you know, we love donations. We also purchase material, um, you know, if it's got a lot of value, um, you know, we're not gonna expect you to donate your big screw tape collection, you know, we'll pay you for that. Um, and we also can work, if you have material um, that's really personal, things like photographs, you know, we can digitize copies of those things so that you can keep your personal copies, but we can add them to the collection. And then um, this is a long shot, but um, you know, any material related to George Floyd would of course be welcome um, just because we're getting contacted by the news organizations. Um, and you know, he was part of the SUC too, so. 
And of course, uh, I have to also make mention because the owner of Screwed Up Records and Tapes unfortunately couldn't be on this uh, this Zoom discussion with us today, but um, he has a different, definite interest in any screw tapes that he does not have because there are so many out there um, and he's not asking for you to donate them. Um, he doesn't, I, I'm not sure if he uh, will purchase them from you, but for sure he does want to make dubs as part of the ongoing uh, screw collection because uh, even to today, uh, as of I think maybe yesterday or the day before yesterday, a few days ago, he just dropped three more <laughs> screw tapes. All so, from 2000. Yeah. All from yeah. The yeah. So this is this has been an ongoing process with preserving his legacy. And I want to thank you both for being a part of this very important conversation so that we can let screwheads know um, how we can keep DJ Screw alive uh, for another two, three, 20 decades uh, and beyond. So thank you all for, for being a part of this discussion today. Thank you for having us. <laughs> thank you, Rocky, and thank you for all your work too as yes. a community educator and um, hip hop force in helping to preserve and share the stories of Houston hip hop. Yeah, thank it's priceless, you. <laughs> priceless work that you're doing, Rocky. Really, it is. You know, we're talking about making ourselves more in the background, but you're becoming more and more of a voice of getting stuff out there, and it's so so important. I will take that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys, and I will talk to you all soon. Okay. Take care. Take care. Happy birthday, DJ Screw. Happy birthday, Screw. Happy birthday, Screw.